This conference will now be recorded. Uh, in case you didn't hear that, we're now being recorded. Okay, so turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 38. Uh, there has been <clears throat> quite a bit of uh, quite a bit written about these two chapters, 38 and 39. Uh, in most of the cases, what has been written is designed to uh, lead us in the path of trying to understand a premillennial uh, point of view, and uh, not going to get into all of that. But 38 and 39 have often been used to talk about the end of time uh, with a combination of passages from Revelation and Daniel. Uh, this has been used as a as a way of saying it's prof, uh, prophecy about uh, the return of Christ, the thousand year reign, uh, and uh, God setting up His kingdom on earth. Uh, again, I'm not going to spend our time today talking about those two chapters in in light of the premillennial uh, point of view. Uh, <clears throat> while it has been a long time, we have looked at that in the past. Uh, and perhaps we need to revisit it, but that will not be today. Um, what I do want to say is that, just very briefly, that while uh, those who use these two passages to talk about the premillennial view uh, want to talk about a combination of literal and symbolic, and it's <clears throat> at times arbitrary, uh, they will say that uh, some of the names are literal and then some of the names are symbolic. Then they'll say the weapons that are mentioned in chapter 39 are symbolic. Uh, the armies are literal. Uh, so that combination poses some logical issues uh, as to how do you discern what's symbolic and what's literal. And, uh, and there are parts in which people are quite clear this has to be symbolism uh, and then the very next verse has to be literal. And uh, so you, you have a logic problem with the text itself doesn't lend itself to saying, let's move back and forth between symbolism and literal. Um, so having said that, that's all I'm going to say. And be well, I would welcome any questions that you have uh, beyond what I've just said, uh, be glad to explain further. But 38 and 39 do go together. But as I said, we're just going to spend our time with chapter 38. <clears throat> Let me uh, set up the context here uh, for this particular chapter. We uh, looked last week at chapter 37, and we only looked at the beginning of chapter 37. We didn't look at the conclusion of chapter 37. Uh, the conclusion of chapter 37 is about the temple and the restoration of the temple. Then you have in chapters 40 through 48, uh, God's emphasis on the restoration of the temple and the spiritual image of the restoration of the temple. So uh, just from a Bible study point of view, the context has two parentheses around chapter 38. The end of chapter 37, the restoration of the temple, 40 through 48, what the restoration of the temple means in a spiritual sense, so whatever comes in between that has got to relate to that. Uh, and, and I think that makes sense. Uh, this, this parenthesis is a way of illustrating for, for Ezekiel. Uh, we're really talking about the restoration of the temple and the restoration of Israel. And how best to do that uh, is to begin at the end of 37 saying this restoration is going to occur. 38 and 39, the restoration of Israel is going to be a part of that restoration of the temple. And then 40 through 48, uh, what the spiritual meaning of that restoration is. Uh, that makes sense to me uh, just from a what we call a hermeneutical point of view. It, it just flows with the thought uh, that began at the end of chapter 37. Remind you that chapter divisions did not occur. Uh, until much, much later. And so if you were reading this in one sitting uh, and you started reading about the temple and then it changed topics to Gog and Magog, uh, you might be a bit confused, but would certainly get back on track at chapter, what we call chapter 40, as he talks about the restoration of the temple. And then that would make you go back and reread 38 and 39 in light of what you had previously 
gotten confused about and now understood. Uh, so I, I open it up for any comments, written or verbal. So 38 and 39, I'm going to answer the second question here on my own. Uh, 38 and 39 is God's reassurance to Israel that they are going to be part of this restoration, that uh, the temple in its restoration is also going to include his people in 38 and 39 uh, are means by which he is going to demonstrate that although there will be outside interference and outside opposition, God is in charge and he will see that the restoration occurs. So when the people hear this from Ezekiel, uh, they hear it in light of this proclamation of God is going to bring his people back to Jerusalem. Okay, so let's look at chapter 38. Uh, the word of the Lord came to me. Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal, prophesy against him and say, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against you, O Gog, chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws and bring you out with your whole army, your horses, your horsemen fully armed and a great horde with large and small shields, all of them brandishing their swords. Persia, Cush and Put will be uh, with them all with shields and helmets, also Gomer with all of its troops, and Beth uh, Togama uh, from the far north with all its troops, the many nations with you. Get ready, be prepared, you and all the hordes gathered about you, and take command of them. After many days, you will be called to arms. In future years, you will invade a land that has recovered from war, whose people were gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They have been brought out from the nations and now all of them live in safety. You and all your troops and the many nations with you will go up advancing like a storm. You will be like a cloud covering the land. This is what the sovereign Lord says. On that day, thoughts will come into your mind and you will devise an evil scheme. You will say, I will invade a land of unwalled villages. I will attack a peaceful and unsuspecting people, all of them living without walls and without gates and bars. I will plunder and loot and turn my hand against the resettled ruins and the people gathered from the nations, rich in livestock and goods, living at the center of the land. Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish and all her villages will say to you, have you come to plunder? Have you gathered your hordes to loot, to carry off silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods and to seize much plunder? Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, this is what the sovereign Lord says. In that day, when my people Israel are living in safety, you will not take notice of it. You will come from your place in the far north, you and many nations with you, all of them riding on horses, a great horde, a mighty army. You will advance against my people Israel like a cloud that covers the land. In days to come, O Gog, I will bring against you, uh, bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I show myself holy through you before their eyes. This is what the sovereign Lord says. Are you not the one I spoke of in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel? At that time, they prophesied for years that I would bring you against them. This is what will happen in that day. When Gog attacks the land of Israel, my hot anger will be aroused, declares the sovereign Lord. In my zeal and fiery wrath, I declare that at that time there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. The fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the beasts of the field, every creature that moves along the ground and all the people on the face of the earth will tremble at my presence. The mountains will be overturned, the cliffs will crumble, and every wall will fall to the ground. I will summon a sword against Gog on all my mountains, declares the sovereign Lord. Every man's sword will be against his brother. I will execute judgment upon him with plague and bloodshed. I will pour down torrents of rain, hailstones and burning sulfur on him and his troops and the many nations with him. And so I will show my greatness and my holiness and I will make myself known in the sight of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord. Okay, so... What's the point of chapter 38? Absolutely. 
and, and this is this is a common theme in Ezekiel. Over and over again, uh, that word sovereign just keeps popping up. Uh, God is sovereign. He's got a plan. He knows what's going to happen. And he's in control of that plan. No one can derail that plan just because they bring their armies. Uh, notice in chapter 38 that Gog has no idea that God is using them. Okay. So... Uh, are these names to be understood literally or figuratively? Um, Gog is unknown. We don't know the name of Gog at all, except here uh, in Revelation. And what we find is that because there is no uh, literal understanding of Gog, we've we've tried to uh, suggest. And again, this is where uh, writers about these two chapters start infusing their ideas. Well, Gog is actually a symbolic name for blah, blah, blah. Well, Magog literally means the land of Gog. So uh, if you if you suddenly start saying Gog is this, then Magog has to have its own uh, association, but it means the land of Gog literally. So uh, Gog and Magog are probably the same thing. Whatever they are, they're probably the same thing. Uh, Persia, Kush, and Put are all real places, and those are places that are associated with Egypt. So you have Gog in the north, Kush, Put uh, to the south, and then be reminded Israel has already experienced this. Uh, they have already gone through wars in which they were conquered from the north and conquered from the south. So it, it appears that whatever is happening here, God is pulling together previous events as a way of either demonstrating this has happened to Israel before and the outcome is going to be my outcome, or he is predicting a future event, <clears throat> a future event. But either way, uh, whether it is a reflection on a past event or current event, or a future event, uh, the point is God is sovereign. Uh, now, for Israel, who has already uh, experienced these kind of wars, uh, there's nothing pleasant thinking that it might be a future event. There's nothing pleasant for them to consider. Uh, to go back to Israel only to face more opposition and only to face more destruction is certainly not a pleasant event. What they think uh, is upon restoration, they will be in peace and they will live in peace forever. Uh, but this little community of Israel has been the crossroads for wars uh, well before they ever established themselves as God's people in that land. And uh, certainly ever since they did establish themselves as God's people in that land. Uh, there's a couple of <clears throat> indicators that uh, this could be past tense rather than future tense. Uh, let's see, uh, in verse 17, are you not the one I spoke of in former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel? At that time, they prophesied for years that I would bring you against them. Uh, that seems to suggest that God is saying, uh, look, this prophecy has already been fulfilled. My prophets talked about this and talked about this destruction coming and, and has indeed come. Uh, so that's a possibility. But there's also a lot of uh, passages in that text that suggest that it's a future. Take it for whatever you want it, whether it's future or past. Uh, don't what, what people do is they come to this trying to figure out is the, if it is the future, how can we explain the future when in fact that's not the point. God says over and over again, uh, the, the nations from the north are going to now realize who God is when this is all finished. All right, according to verse four, who initiates this battle? God does. Yeah. Uh, again, this idea, uh, you can imagine the nations thinking I, we're going to go and attack or we have attacked 
uh, again, future or past doesn't really change the emphasis. Uh, thinking we are doing this on our own power, we're doing this under our own uh, desires, but God says, no, nope, I've got this plan already put together. And I want these nations to do that. The image in verse four, I will turn you around, put hooks in your jaws and bring you out with your whole army. Uh, doesn't sound anything like a, a, an army moving under its own influence. Uh, I'm not a fisherman. Uh, don't claim to be a fisherman. Uh, but the hook in the mouth kind of speaks of an image of someone who is against their will being uh, reeled in to do something. And that is certainly the image that God is wanting to establish here. So uh, question seven, why is God attacking? Why is Gog, not God, why is Gog attacking? <clears throat> Yeah. 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 For them, it's a matter of uh, easy access to uh, to profits. Right. Uh, little effort will will bring in great profits, and uh, I mean money, wealth, and not not. Not prophetic, yeah. Uh, but we'll bring in, we'll bring in, because these cities have no walls about them, no real armies to contend with. We'll just swoop in, we'll take everything that we want, and then we'll go back. Uh, according to verse 17, what is God going to do through Gog? fulfill prophecy yeah yeah he's going to demonstrate through god that he is a completer of prophetic uh, of a prophetic voice and and so again all of this appears to uh, from a human standpoint it appears that god is doing its own thing creating an atmosphere where they can uh, attack and receive great benefit from that attack without much effort at all and yet from the very beginning we're told god is initiating this god is making this happen it all of this is part of the plan of god it's a fulfillment of what prophets have talked about previously and so the question is does god know that god is using them and the answer is no they have no idea that god is using them uh, Again, uh, in, in this case, we have an opportunity where uh, God through Ezekiel tells us exactly how he operates with this particular nation. But I don't think it's against the uh, intent of scripture to understand that God is still working among nations and he is still uh, has plans for nations. Now, w uh, un unless, unless I've missed something, uh, we have no uh, voices telling us what God is doing in the nations particularly. What we do know is as believers, we know that God has a way of working in the nations even when we are uncertain about his working. Uh, this uh, again is part of the emphasis of chapter 38 that the people of Israel are to trust that God knows exactly what's happening when the hordes from the north start coming in uh, into its borders. Uh, God is going to take care of that not Israel. So question 10, what does all of this tell you about God? Well, I've kind of answered that, haven't I? So let's go to question 11. What does Israel do in this text to protect herself? They do nothing. Yeah, Israel does nothing. Uh, they, they don't build walls. They don't amass an army. Uh, they are ripe for the picking and yet, when it comes time, they do nothing. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, they do have to do the cleaning up afterwards. But in order to protect themselves, the idea is they do nothing. Uh, uh, chapter 39, if you read on into that, they do have to clean up and they do get to collect the plunder. But, um, you know, how hard is that? And so, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's like sweeping the streets afterwards. Uh, so here, here is the image. Uh, God initiates, God protects, God uh, provides all that is needed, and Israel's response to that is what? Tremble, Tremble sits back and watches, but it's not just merely watch, it is to know something, right? Yeah, that when it's all said and done, they're going to look and say, God is something else. God is something else. Uh, I know it's been a week, but this is, this is rem a reminder of what we talked about last week in the sermon that on paper, Israel should have never defeated the Amalekites. Uh, and yet when it was all over with, what did they, they, they marveled at God's ability. They built this altar, God is my banner, uh, and praise God. Well, this is what's going to happen here. This restoration, when they come back and they are a people of peace, God is saying, look, there's still going to be nations from the north, but I'm going to protect you. I'm going to take care of you. And when it's all said and done, you'll know that I'm the Lord. Uh, you'll know that I'm the one who's in charge. Now, this is, uh, turn back to Ezekiel chapter 32. This is the reason I believe these two chapters need to be seen not only in the context, end of chapter 37 through the rest of the writing, but they also need to be seen in a greater context uh, that this is not about something uh, futuristic, uh, that is the, the great Armageddon, which is what is often discussed uh, in, in light of these two, two, uh, two chapters. But look back at verse, uh, or chapter 32, And you know, if you forget to write down verses and you think, I'll remember where that is, um, you suddenly find yourself hunting for where those verses are. Okay. Uh, no, 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 that's not it. That's not it. 26. 26, thank you. 26, that's it. Uh, hadn't gotten to 26 yet. I was reading every verse until then, so hadn't gotten to 26. Thank you. Uh, this is a prophecy, chapter 32, is a prophecy against Israel, uh, I mean against Egypt, and it is a prophecy uh, telling Egypt uh, for all that you've done against my people over the years, over the centuries, and for all of your um, attempts to rule the earth uh, without seeking me, uh, God is going to do a final punishment on Egypt. And he mentions Assyria in verse 22. He mentions Elam in verse 24. In other words, as I'm taking care of Egypt, I'm also going to take care of these other nations. Assyria is to the north. Elam is to the, uh, to the uh, east. And then you come down to verse 26. Meshach and Tubal are there with all their hordes around their graves. Uh, do you remember back in chapter 38 reading about those two nations as well? Uh, verse 2 of chapter 38, son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tubal. So when you look at chapter 32, where these two nations are mentioned, and then come back to chapter 38, where these two nations are mentioned in a greater context of Gog and Magog, 
the prophecy of chapter 32 now goes with the prophecy of chapter 38. Whatever you want to say about the nations of the north, uh, as God has already prophesied in chapter 32, he is going to uh, take care of all nations that are connected either to the north or to the south, south being Egypt. And as he is taking care of Egypt in chapter 32, now he proclaims that he's going to take care of the nations of the north in chapter 38. Again, in the greater context, it just makes sense to see this as a flow of God's announcing what's going to happen to the nations rather than uh, trying to create a new vision only for the nations of the north. Questions? Or comments? Chapter 3810, okay. Right. Yeah, it, it's it's not their idea. 3810, uh, they, they sit around planning, thinking of how can I do this, how can I gain that, and the result is that they actually think it's theirs, but it's not. Yes, yes. Um, isn't it amazing how we think and we, oh, I've come up with this plan or I've devised this scheme or, uh, and it may even be a good thing. We think it's a good thing. Uh, you know, I don't think we sit around trying to devise evil, uh, but we come up with plans and uh, then then run it through the car wash of prayer, you know, sanitize it in some way. That's an appropriate word, uh, sanitize. Uh, and, and, and we feel better about it, but it's not our plan. Um, how do you... How do you See, I wasn't going that direction, but that's got me thinking. Um, no, no, I love that. So how do we how do we stop that? How do we prevent that? How do we work with that? Because planning is certainly a, you know, God's a planner. He he put that within us to, to think and to plan. When I want something badly and I'm praying for it, I'm thinking, whoa, back up. Where's this coming from? It was in the book of him. Yeah. Yeah, kind of out of your own passion, and they and your own passion kind of generates the enthusiasm for the plan. But then you have to kind of step back, and that's a hard part is stepping back because you think I wouldn't have to be this excited about it if it wasn't from God, right? Yeah. Um, buying nothing on the spur of the moment, right? Uh, spontaneous buying is usually regretful buying. Uh, I've done that enough, so I know. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not going to buy a new car today. Yes, I am. Uh, so <laughs> I've done that enough. <laughs> I just want to look. That looks nice. I, I think I'll look at that. Uh, spontaneous buying is is regretful buying, uh, but. That, that idea of giving it time, um, I was trying to think where I first heard this. I've heard it multiple times, but if it's something you want to do, uh, the, the, the phrasing is sleep on it for 24 to 48 hours and then see if you still really want to do it uh, kind of thing. And there's, there's wisdom in that. Uh, <clears throat> sharing that with other people demands that we understand we're not in isolation. Yeah, open to criticism, open to <laughs> being humble. Yeah, yeah, and and in some cases humiliated <laughs> because they'll look at you. You don't want to do that. That is not what you want. Yeah.
listing requires their supporters to do another thing to ask for wisdom so that what they do will be reported. And and you know those kind of things. And I, again, I'm just thinking because I wasn't going this direction, but it but it seems it seems like with something like that, if you're asking supporters to encourage you, you don't do anything until you hear from supporters. I, I'm just thinking, I don't know. But I mean, if you're asking supporters, what do you think? And you hear nothing but crickets, you probably ought to rethink the whole process. Well, in this case, they weren't asking for advice. They were just saying, pray right, that we might understand what kind of place. Right, right. For wisdom and for guidance. But even with that, I think there has to be some kind of, if, if you're saying help us to understand, maybe that's where the intervention comes in and you say, I, obviously I don't know everything, but here's what I'm thinking. And uh, you know, I, I don't think any one person is the bastion of all God's wisdom. So you, you, you kind of, that, that's an interesting, um, no, it's just, uh, it, it's challenging. Because I think I think we live at a uh, where we just you know we might talk it over with a, a close friend or a spouse or a family member and then we just go do it and whoever we talk it over with may see life the same way we see it and thus there's no opposition we think oh that that's got to be a good thing to do so, right right and then we pray that they have wisdom before we talk to them. Right, right. To respond to us, how we need to be responded. Yeah. Because even, even, and I'm, we just keep going down this path, and the hole is getting deeper and deeper. But, but you know, it, it. You're asking a person to be so honest with you that they're willing to hurt your feelings over it, and that. <laughs> Again, in our in our culture, we don't do that. Uh, our job is not to hurt people; it's to make them feel okay. Uh, my students um, in counseling, I, I teach two courses on skills counseling, and uh, uh, we do role plays. And uh, role plays are always fun. Uh, but inevitably, uh, in the role play, as they're trying to be this pretend therapist, as they're trying to just develop some skills, uh, the, the person who's pretending to be the client will say something, and I'm sitting there going, you've got to confront that. You cannot let that go. And they, the, the student will just say something that's really mealy. You know, it's just touchy-feely stuff. Well, I can see how you feel, blah, 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 you know. I'm going, yeah, you, okay, n now what? And and uh, afterwards, as part of their evaluation, I will say, tell me what you were thinking during that particular event. And they'll say, I just didn't want to make them feel bad. And, I, and, and my response is, that's your job. It's, your job is to make them feel bad. That's how they learn. That's how people change. That's how people grow. Well, they may get mad at me, yeah? Yeah, they may say all kinds of mean things to you, but that's part of your responsibility. And but in our culture, we don't do that because we're we're primed to think I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. But the flip side of that is true too, that when we ask someone for what they think about our plan, we have to be willing to hear them say. That is a terrible plan and we're often not we often get very defensive about a bad idea <laughs> yeah yeah and, and then and debbie says and then we go out and ask somebody else who will agree with us yeah uh i just didn't understand fully you know maybe i didn't communicate well uh that, but that's exactly right we have to not only be willing to to, re to ask somebody and for them to take it upon themselves to say uh, whether it's good or bad, uh, here's what God would want rather than this. 
uh, we also have to be willing to accept that, that, that humility to say, I'm willing to accept that. Uh, this this is not a better discussion than what I had planned, but it's certainly a fruitful discussion to what I had planned. Uh, what Our time is coming close to an end, so I wanna kind of wrap things up. In chapter 38, uh, God, what God does is uh, look down in, uh, we already looked at verse four, where he's going to put a hook in the mouths of Gog and bring them into uh, the land to attack the land. Uh, all the while they're thinking they've got this figured out. Verse 19, I declare, this is God, I declare that at that time there shall be a great earthquake. And then he says, uh, down in verse 20, the mountains will be overturned, cliffs will crumble, every wall will fall. I will summon a sword against Gog on all my mountains. Uh, every man's sword will execute. I will execute judgment upon him with plague and bloodshed. I will pour down torrents of rain, hailstones, and burning sulfur on him and his troops and the many nations with him. And I will show my greatness and my holiness. I will make myself known in the sight of many nations. Uh, if you didn't get it, uh, underscore I, 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 I will do this, I will do this, I will do this, I will do. God is the one who is bringing all of this about. God is the one who's going to defend Israel. God is the one who's going to bring about his holiness so that all nations will know that he is holy. Uh, when it's all said and done, by the time you get to the end of chapter 38 and heading into chapter 39, what God says is, I want to make sure that everyone has an opportunity to see my holiness. Why? Why is that so important? For God, I, let's, listen, listen, don't, don't just get on a surface level here. Why is it important to God that all nations see his holiness? I mean, does God need that? Is God in some way deficient until that happens? Is God lacking in something until all of his all nations see his holiness? We would say no. So why is it important for God's holiness to be seen among the nations? So that they can turn to him because exactly. they need him. Exactly. Uh, which speaks to God's grace. Even in the midst of all this destruction that God's going to bring. It's an opportunity for the nations to see his grace, to see who he really is, uh, to see his greatness and his holiness. Only God could do what God can do. Israel was uh, limited in its ability to defend itself and to maintain uh, it's peacefulness. Only God could do that. Uh, if this is a um, future prophecy and not a past revealing, uh, the fullness of this prophecy would be found in uh, what he did through Christ, uh, where his holiness could be seen through the cross. Uh, because there was indeed an army that came from the north, Rome. Uh, there was an army that invaded, but Israel was still relatively at peace. But the internal conflict uh, certainly generated uh, a time for God to show his greatness and his holiness, and it coincides with the cross. Okay, uh, we, we just need to wind it up here. Thanks so much for your participation and your uh inclusion today with our lesson. Next week, we're going to look at uh, uh, chapters 40 through 48, uh, kind of as a group, um, and uh, point out two or three things from there, uh, revealing the spiritual importance of the restoration of the temple and what that means spiritually, not only for Israel, but for us as well. Uh, we'll join together again for our assembly here in about 45 minutes and looking forward to sharing that time together. Thanks so much.